This video is part of the series in a first course in modelling, analysis and control. And here we're going to focus on an introduction to feedback. Now, the first thing you need to do is remind yourself of the introductory videos that you've already hopefully looked at right at the start. This will remind you of why we're interested in behaviours and also the concept of feedback to improve behaviours. Open loop behaviour then. So far this module has focused on open loop behaviour. This can be stable, unstable, and it might be stable but slow or oscillatory, and moreover it might settle at the wrong value. So what are you going to do if the behaviour you're getting from your system is unacceptable? As an engineer, First, you're going to analyse the behaviour of a given system, and we've done that with our first and second order dynamics and behaviours. Then you're going to ask yourself, what constitutes desirable behaviour? And that will depend on the system. And finally, you're going to implement some changes to achieve the desirable behaviour. Now, the remainder of this module focuses on the third point, and it's going to exploit all the analysis tools that we've derived so far. So first and second order responses, Laplace transforms, inverse Laplace, ODEs, and so forth. Weaknesses of open loop control. So why can't we control car speed with our eyes shut? Why can't we control the temperature of a mixed flow without a temperature sensor? Why is unmonitored cooking likely to fail? Now these were covered in the introductory videos, but I'm just going to remind you of the basics. All these systems lack a measurement or observation. That is a mechanism for checking what the system is actually doing. Without observation, we do not know whether the behaviour is correct, and hence we have no information with which to update our system input. Let's show some examples then of how we deal with it in practice. So getting temperature of a shower correct. What do we do? We turn on the hot tap. Then we turn on the cold tap, probably about halfway. We wait maybe 20 seconds and then monitor the temperature. Is this OK? If it's too hot, we open the cold tap more, and if it's too cold, we close the cold tap a bit. We wait a few more seconds and monitor the temperature again. And again, if it's too hot, we open the cold a bit more, and if it's too cold, we close the cold a bit more. We wait a few seconds and monitor. And you can see we continue to iterate until we are happy. Now, the notice here, the key role of monitoring followed by some adjustment and observation. What about getting the speed of a car correct? So what do we do? We depress the accelerator, the expected distance required, wait a few seconds and then look at the speed. Is this OK? If it's too slow, we depress the accelerator a bit more. If it's too fast, we lift off the accelerator slightly. We wait a few more seconds and monitor the speed. And you see again, we're repeating the process. So we have an iteration and we continue iterating until we're happy. So you notice again the key role of monitoring and then an adjustment based upon that observation. So a summary, humans control systems with very simple strategies. We have an iterative procedure of monitor, decide, adjust, monitor, decide, adjust, and so on. But there's a problem. In industry, a level in a tank must be maintained accurately all year round, 24 seven. A temperature must be maintained at possibly 400 degrees using a tap, which is only four yards from the object little bit hot for humans. The chemical process may have 10,000 different outputs which must all be monitored and controlled simultaneous and most humans couldn't cope with that. So humans get bored easily. We make mistakes if asked to do repetitive tasks for long periods. We're not good in hostile environments. We cannot deal with many simultaneous tasks. We're expensive. We cannot do fast timescales and so on. So we need to look at how do industry deal with the fact that we can't use humans. And the industrial example we're going to use is a bit like a shower. So it's a bit like mixing hot and cold water to get something at the right temperature. So it's called a heat exchanger. So what you'll see is the top bit, we have the basic process. So I'm going to circle it here. And this is the heat exchanger bit. So you see, what do we have? We have a hot stream coming in and then coming in here and going out there we have a cold flow which is trying to cool the hot stream down and obviously what we want to do is get the outlet stream to be at the desired temperature 
whatever that desired temperature is. So as we change the cold flow, that will extract different amounts of heat from the hot stream and hopefully we can get the temperature correct. Now, that's the basic process. So you're going to have an ordinary differential equation model or similar for that. So what do we do next? Well, the next thing we've got to do is actually measure the temperature. So you can see here we have a measuring device and it's what that measuring device is isn't important for this slide. But there is some measuring device from which you can determine the temperature. Now, likely that measuring device will give some sort of signal in volts or amps or something else. And you're going to need to translate that into a temperature. But again, that's not the purpose of this particular module. Now, having done that, the next thing you've got to do is you've got to compare that temperature with the temperature that you actually want. So you'll see this little word down here at the bottom where it says set point. That basically is what temperature would you like and how does that compare to the temperature that you're actually measuring? And then what you've got in here is basically a decision. So you can see it says here control room. So this could be some control operator, but in practice, it's probably a computer. So there's a decision process which says, how much do I need to change the cold water flow? So that decision's taken. Again, it's probably supplied as a voltage or a current. And that will drive some actuation. And you can see the actuation there, which will change the cold water flow. Now, this diagram is quite messy. And you're thinking, yes, especially after I've drawn all over it, you're not very happy. So what we tend to do is we reduce it to something which is easier to visualize. So we can see the interconnections and dependencies between signals. So here you see I've got a box of my process and that might well be represented by an ODE model or something similar. And the temperature comes out here. Here we've got the sensor. So that's how we measure the temperature and turn it into something that we can actually use. This bit over here essentially is the control room. OK, so this is where we take our measurement of the temperature, we compare it with a set point, and then this controller is where we make a decision and say, well, what flow do we want? Now, that decision is expressed as a voltage or a current or something similar. So that then goes into the actuation, which is there, and that delivers the flow, which goes into the process. But you can see the key point is having these block diagrams, we can see the dependencies a bit more easily um, and we can actually get our heads around what's going on. So feedback key attributes. We measure the output and compute the error as compared to the target. And you can see that that's this bit here. So we've got measurement here, H of S, and then we compare the measurement with the target and that gives us an error. What's the difference between what we want and what we've got? Then action. We basically decide, based upon that error, what do we need to do? So we choose U. I haven't bothered with the actuation, but this K represents the actuation. And then finally, we've got constant monitoring. So we're constantly monitoring what the output is doing and constantly comparing it with the target and updating our decision. And so what we've done here is essentially replicated what humans do. We monitor, we adjust, the system goes through the dynamics, we monitor again, we adjust, and so on. And you can see this feedback loop is essentially doing that. Now, here's a key point. The introduction of feedback implicitly gives rise to different behaviour. Now, this can be used to advantage to design in the desired behaviour. So here's an example. And you can see the closed loop behaviour with the red line is very different from the open loop behaviour with the blue line. And I'm not making decisions about whether this is good or bad behaviour, but the key thing is that different control laws, different decision making processes will lead to different closed loop behaviours. So we can exploit this flexibility in our control laws to get the behaviour that we would like. The impact of feedback. So we need to be systematic. Feedback changes the behaviour and therefore the underlying closed loop model. So feedback can, it can improve transient behaviour. It can reduce offset in the steady state, i.e. make the target what we actually want. However, feedback could also make, make transient behaviour worse or even unstable. So a key aim of this course 
is to design good feedback. So the module requirements. We need to be able to analyse feedback loops. So this is going to use all the tools we've developed so far when we basically look to first and second order models and behaviours and so forth. And something we're going to do next is we're going to look at the impact of proportional control and PI control because they're the most common techniques used in industry. So I need to understand the link between the control parameters I can choose and the closed loop behaviour that results. And once I understand that link, I can then go about being systematic and choose the control law parameter to ensure I get the desirable closed loop behaviour. Now, there are a number of MATLAB GUIs <coughs> which we would encourage you to use in your own time. And I'm going to just demonstrate one here very quickly. This is called the stick. Basically, the target is to get this man to this pink blob here. So if I press run, you can see they're not making it. And at the moment, I've got proportional gain of one. So let's make that a bit bigger and run again. You can see they're not making it. You see their response here. They're not getting to the target. Let's make the proportional gain bigger. They're not quite making it. Now, you don't understand why, because we've not done the analysis yet. So you say, oh, this proportional is not working. Let's try this integral term. So we run that. Oh, that doesn't look very good. It's a bit bizarre. Let's change the integral a bit more. Oh, I'm not sure that looks particularly good either. Let's make it even bigger. And you can see now it's beginning to oscillate. Not good at all. What if we combine the two together? Now that's beginning to look a lot better. But the issue for you is how do we go about this systematically rather than through trial and error? So some conclusions. We've introduced the concept of feedback for managing behaviour. Feedback is essential in the presence of uncertainty, which is commonplace in most engineering scenarios. The resulting behaviour is highly dependent on the feedback law selected, so this can make behaviour worse if done poorly. So the resources that follow are going to look at how we analyse the closed loop system, that is characterise its behaviours, and from that we then get some insights which we can use to undertake systematic control law design.